What's up guys, this is Ultimate Eye Device Vids, and today in this video we're going to be going hands-on with every major iOS version ranging from the original iPhone OS 1 all the way up to the latest iOS 15. So we're going to be reviewing every major software update that has ever run on the iPhone. I managed to install every iOS firmware ranging again from iOS 1 to 15 on a variety of my devices, with the exception of just two firmwares, being iOS 11 and iOS 13. Surprisingly, a few of those new or firmwares were actually difficult to get my hands on. But again, every other iOS firmware is installed and ready to go, and we're going to be taking a trip down memory lane and taking a look at some of the noteworthy features and changes that each of these iOS versions brought to the table. And all right, let's go ahead and jump into it. So first up, of course, iPhone OS 1. And of course, this was made for the original iPhone and the original iPod Touch. So at this point in time, there's just a few basic stock applications that came with iOS, things like calendar, settings, calculator, clock, etc. And on the iPhone, there was an SMS text app, of course, the phone application, and a few other additions exclusive to the iPhone, like the notes application, the stocks app, the maps app, the mail app, the camera application. But it was very simple. No home screen pages, no app store at the time, so no ability to download applications natively. You couldn't even rearrange the home screen layout, as you could see. And all of these applications here, very, you know, limited uh, set of options, certainly nothing like we're used to seeing in modern iOS versions, of course. You know, you still had things like the alarm application or clock application that's largely unchanged today. But as you can see in the settings here, just a very limited amount of options in comparison to what we have today. So crazy to see iOS in its infancy here. And there was no app store at the time. So Apple's push when the iPhone and iPod Touch originally launched was for web applications to be a big way of accessing information. So basically just apps to be run directly in Safari. Obviously, that never really took off, so that's why they introduced the App Store, which brings us to our next iOS version, being iPhone OS 2. So without a doubt, of course, the App Store was the headlining feature of iPhone OS 2. Of course, it gives users the ability to download applications and gives developers the opportunity to provide and sell applications on an official App Store. And of course, this brings the ability to rearrange home screen icons, of course, because you now have the ability to download apps from the App Store. And some other noteworthy features include push email, as you can see right here. Also, the mail contacts and calendar settings are now grouped together, which in iPhone OS 1 was not the case. Also, the ability to move multiple emails at once in the stock mail app. Also, the contacts icon has been added to the home screen of the iPhone. In iPhone OS 1, the icon for contacts specifically was exclusive to the iPod Touch. In the iPhone, you would just access it in the phone app. And also, you're now able to search for contacts in the contacts application. iPhone OS 2 also brought the ability to take screenshots just with the home and power button like that. Also the scientific calculator that you access in landscape mode like this. Uh, this was the first time it was brought to any iPhone OS. Also some go-to iPhone uh, features and shortcuts were added. For instance, the ability to scroll to the top of a page by tapping on the status bar. Also parental restriction controls were added for the first time. And the camera now supported geotagging for the first time as well. And as crazy as it is to think about the iPhone without some of these basic features, these initial versions of iPhone OS is what brought these to the table. And another interesting fact is the iPhone OS 2 upgrade was free for all iPhone users However, for iPod Touch users, it cost $9.95, which is totally unheard of in today's standards. All iOS updates are free, so definitely a change in the business model there. And of course, next up is iPhone OS 3. As you can see here, visually, not a huge upgrade, but some very important and noteworthy features added in iPhone OS 3. And the most noteworthy of which, in my opinion, is copy and paste support. So, so for the first time, you're now able to tap to bring up the selection menu here, you could select, select all. Then you have the ability to cut, copy, or paste, as you can see, just like this. So I get a very important step in making the iPhone a lot more productive and useful. And of course, you're also able to uh, use these drag handles to select text, as you can see, like this. And another headlining feature in iPhone OS 3 was the landscape keyboard, as you can see here for the first time. Of course, back in the day, iPhone screens were very small, 3.5 inches for the first several versions. So this landscape keyboard made things a lot easier. Also, another noteworthy feature is spotlight search. This was the first time you swipe over like this to the side, 
You have the ability to search your iPhone for you know applications, notes, etc. Of course, it was not that advanced at the time, but again, the, the beginning of a very important feature on the iPhone. iPhone OS 3 also introduced the voice memos and compass applications for the very first time on the iPhone. As you can see here, this is the original iPhone 2G, so the compass app isn't supported, but on newer iPhones, it was there. And also the message application was renamed from text in iPhone OS 2 to messages. Of course, iPhone OS 2 on the left, iPhone OS 3 on the right. Also, the icon used to say SMS in the middle there. As you can see, it no longer does in iPhone OS 3. Also, iPhone OS 3 brought the ability to sign in to the native YouTube application. As you can see here, uh, in iPhone OS 3, you're now able to sign in or you were not previously able to do that in iPhone OS 2. And this, of course, enables the ability to like and favorite videos and all that good stuff. If you guys were around for the native YouTube application on iOS, drop a comment down below. And one last feature of iPhone OS 3 is the ability to delete multiple photos at a time, as you can see right here. And next up, iOS 4. So this was the first time iPhone OS was renamed to iOS, which is, of course, its name to date. And iOS 4 was a huge upgrade. I remember this was actually the first upgrade that I took place in because my first iPod touch was on iOS 3 and then I upgraded it to iOS 4. And as you can see here, the most noticeable change is the ability to have home screen wallpaper in addition to the lock screen. So you were able to set, you know, the same wallpaper for the lock screen and the home screen or a different wallpaper for either as you're able to do today. And the other headlining feature of iOS 4 is multitasking. So for the first time, you're able to actually have an app switcher here, which I'll get into in just a second, but also have the ability to, when you're in an application, for the application to resume where you left off. So iPhone OS 3 here on the left, iOS 4 on the right, as you can see the difference. So let's say you're in an application as simple as settings and you, you know, you're in some of the menus here and you close out to the home screen. As you can see in iPhone OS 3, you go back in, it takes you all the way back to the first you know, opening screen. The application has to completely launch. For the first time in iOS 4, as you can see, it picks up where you left off. The app is actually stored in the memory of the device. And of course, once again, you could also double tap and access any recently opened apps just like this to quickly switch between them, as you can see, which is super convenient. You could also close these apps by tapping and holding, then you press the little minus. And that's how the applications were able to be closed. And if you slide over to the right, you have this little iPod widget, which was for the first time added. So you could play, skip, go back, etc. Also, the orientation lock feature was new to iOS 4. So you could lock your iPhone in portrait orientation. So the iPhone would stay in portrait orientation no matter what app you were in or no matter what you were doing. And there's just some overall fundamental design changes. All the icons have been slightly reworked in comparison to iPhone OS 3. As you can see, they're a little bit more glossy, a little bit more lifelike, which I like. Also, the dock is actually this new glass uh, reflective rather than just the gray that it was previously. And just the overall animations of the operating system from unlocking the device, as you can see, has been changed from, you know, the physics of scrolling between home screen pages and, of course, app animations, as you can see. Uh, were definitely updated to be a lot more snappy, in my opinion. And of course, I can't forget folders. This was the first iOS to bring folders to the table. As you can see, you're able to create folders with up to 12 apps at the time. You could name them whatever you want, and you just drag any app on top of another app, and there you go. You could create a folder just like that. And also, Game Center. So this was an application Apple released for users to compete with other users on App Store games and whatnot. Of course, it has all your stats and everything for certain games in here, so... That brings back a lot of memories for me on the iPod Touch. Also, Game Center wasn't added in the initial release of iOS 4. It was added in 4.1. And a few other noteworthy changes in iOS 4 was the addition of a unified inbox for all your emails and mail application, which was super handy. And also the ability to create new playlists in the iPod and music applications without having to do it on your computer and then sync it through iTunes. You could do it directly on the device for the first time. So without a doubt, at the time that it was released, I think iOS 4 was definitely the biggest software upgrade yet. And next up, of course, iOS 5. As you can see, at a first glance, visually, it's not that different than iOS 4, but there's a ton of a very useful features and changes packed under the hood. It's actually one of the most important updates to the iPhone, in my opinion. And I'll start off with the notification centers. So this was the first iOS to bring a notification drop-down menu uh, to iOS. Of course, this was a feature that, at the time, a lot of people wanted because it was on Android, so just a center to manage all your notifications. As you can see, there's also a few widgets that it came preloaded with as well. And going back to what I said earlier about it being one of the most important updates to the iPhone, I say that because iOS 5 was the first iOS to bring iCloud to the iPhone, to bring iMessage to the iPhone, 
and also to bring over-the-air software updates to the iPhone. So these are three very important features that kind of untethered the iPhone from the computer. And another thing iOS 5 brought was the ability to set up an iPhone or iPod Touch without, again, connecting to the computer. So a lot of you guys might not know this, but in iOS 4 and earlier, in order to set up any iPhone or iPod Touch, you needed to connect your iPhone to your computer with iTunes installed on it to activate it. And to manage all of your data, you know, whether it be backups, contacts, contacts, etc. That all had to be done through iTunes on the computer. However, with iCloud, of course, everything changed. You're able to back up everything, sync everything right on the device. And same thing goes with software updates. Software updates used to be only accessible through iTunes when your iPhone was connected to your computer. But again, iOS 5 was the first time you're able to do that straight on the device. So again, some very important features and infrastructure added to the iPhone with iOS 5. And once again, as I just said, the ability to set up your device without having to connect it to iTunes. So this is another device on iOS 5 that hasn't been set up. As you can see, this is the first time you're able to go through this menu where you know you select the language, et cetera, Wi-Fi, and again, set everything up on the device. I know it's hard to believe that this wasn't a thing, but in earlier versions of iOS, it would just have a connect to iTunes screen and you'd have to plug it into iTunes to set it up. And in addition to all this, again, it brought iMessage for the very first time to the iPhone, which is just an absolutely hugely successful messaging service. Of course, the whole blue bubble, green bubble uh, war started again with iOS 5 and iMessage. So of course, Apple's instant messaging service that works across you know, all devices that are Apple, Mac, iPhone, iPad. And it also makes it easier to send messages when you don't have cell service because of course it goes through the internet. And a few more details in regards to the new notification center, of course, in addition to just having this here uh, in the notification settings, uh, you're also now able to choose for the first time uh, between having the standard you know, pop-up alert, which was standard in all iOS versions before. There was no banners at the time. This was the first iOS that brought banners. And of course, you could choose between those two things for pretty much all your applications, which was, again, a very welcome change at the time. And iOS 5 also brought a few applications, some new stock applications. The Reminders app. This was the first time this was ever added to iOS, as you can see. So this is an app that a lot of people still use today. Also, the newsstand folder. So as much as it does look like an app, it's basically just a folder where magazines and papers that you downloaded from the App Store would appear in here. So uh, this is no longer available in modern versions of iOS, but it was definitely a staple of iOS 5 at the time. And also, iOS 5 was the first iOS version to split up the iPod app that was in previous versions of iOS into two applications, being music and videos. So again, in earlier versions of iOS, the iPod encased all of those things, songs, videos, everything all in one. And Again, with iOS 5, as you can see, you have a separate app for music and a separate app for videos. And interestingly enough, on iPod Touches, these two things were always split up, but again, this is the first time it was split on the iPhone. Next up, iOS 6. Not a huge upgrade overall by my standards, but definitely some important features packed under the hood. And it's also worth noting, this is the first iOS to ship on the iPhone 5 and iPod Touch 5th generation with the slightly larger display, four inches, and I've got it running on an iPhone 5 right now. So I'd say the biggest change in iOS 6 was the introduction of Apple Maps. So traditionally, in every early version of iOS, Apple used Google Maps for the stock Maps app. This was the first time they had their own service. And uh, if you guys were around at the time, you would have remembered the launch was very rough. A lot of complaints from users. There was even a lot of reports of the navigation just being completely wrong, taking people to the wrong locations. So uh, it was definitely a rough moment for Apple, but it did bring some pretty neat, you know, features. For instance, flyover, which is this cool feature that allows you to explore areas in this new way where you can see, you know, uh, buildings and everything very up close in this cool 3D uh, type experience. Uh, but again, I just think the overall usability of Apple Maps uh, or certainly features like this were kind of drowned out by the overall uh, poor quality when it initially launched. And it also brought turn-by-turn -turn navigation. iOS 6 brought Do Not Disturb to the iPhone. So this is a feature that a lot of people use daily, myself included. It's one of my favorite features that allows you to filter your notifications and calls down to specific people that you determine in the settings application. Great for going to bed at night. iOS 6 also brought the Passbook application, which is just a hub to manage, you know, tickets, boarding passes, you know, coupons, etc., all from one application. iOS 6 also brought full screen Safari. So if you're in landscape mode, you get this new little button to go full screen like this which was a nice feature. And in comparison with iOS 5 here on the left, just overall across the OS, there's some tweaked design language. For instance, the status bar and navigation bar area, as you can see, it's a little bit more blue. There's this blue status bar that's introduced uh, throughout you know, a variety of applications. So 
just kind of overall uh, tweaked design language. And as a perfect segue into the next operating system being iOS 7, iOS 6 today is regarded as basically the last operating system with this design language. And that brings us to iOS 7. So iOS 7 was at the time, and I honestly think still today, without a doubt, the biggest iOS update to ever be released in terms of just the amount of things changed and updated. iOS 7 was a complete system-wide redesign of iOS. As you can see, all new home screen icons, new animations, and of course, inside of applications even, just a whole new design. Everything has been flattened, again, from the UI of applications to the home screen icons, uh, the whole skeuomorphic appearance of the lifelike elements of iOS 6 and earlier is no more with iOS 7. Uh, again, everything's been modernized, flattenized, and as you can see, this is basically the same design language that is still present today in iOS. So in terms of just it being recognizable to the modern standards, I think this was without a doubt when that trend started. And one of the huge headlining features of iOS 7 was the new app switcher. So for the first time, the app switcher now features full app preview screenshots. So you could see what's going on in an application before you switch to it, just like that. And of course, the whole physics of it, everything has been redesigned. As you can see, you slide across like this, you swipe up on app screenshots to close them, as you can see. Uh, again, just at the time, this was such a huge and crazy update. I remember, you know, when this first came out, just the excitement of having a completely new experience in iOS. And another huge feature of iOS 7 was the control center. So it wasn't just design related. As you can see, there's also some huge features. For the very first time, the ability to toggle different settings without actually going into the settings app directly through this menu. So screen brightness, volume, also some shortcuts to some useful things. And actually for the very first time, a flashlight button to access the flashlight straight you know, from the device without having to use the camera application. Folders also got a huge rework in iOS 7. As you can see, the whole design is different. Also, in addition to the design, you're able to fit an unlimited amount of applications in each folder. You could just scroll between pages if you had multiple in here. And the design, of course, is just updated to fit the rest of iOS 7. Also, AirDrop was introduced with iOS 7. So the ability to share pictures, files, just over the air to people. Of course, it kind of got overshadowed by the complete redesign of everything, but you know, a very big feature added. But yeah, guys, all in all, of course, iOS 7 was just about this brand new system redesign. Safari was an area that got a lot of attention. Of course, when you scroll down, as you can see, the URL bar shrinks uh, and the bottom bar disappears, just like it does currently in iOS. But of course, at the time, this was just a whole revolutionary new experience for users. And of course, Notification Center got some big upgrades as well. As you can see, the things are now differentiated into three tabs today which has a bunch of widgets, information about your upcoming day, and then all and missed as well. And something else I remember people being very impressed with with iOS 7 is the live clock icon on the home screen. As you can see, it's actually updating live with the accurate time, which at the time was a brand new thing. And some other noteworthy features that iOS 7 brought to the table was FaceTime audio. So for the very first time, you're able to call people over audio with FaceTime. Again, often got overshadowed by the redesign, but that's something that I actually use quite often. Also, background app refresh was added with iOS 7 as well. So the ability to have certain applications refresh their content when you're not directly in them. So the content is ready when you open up the application. When iOS 7 launched, there was a huge controversy at the the time just because a lot of people hated the new design. It was just such a departure from what people were used to with iPhone. So without a doubt, in terms of an iOS update, it was the most attention that it got from the general public. Next up is iOS 8. In terms of a visual refresh, nothing huge really, just kind of building upon the design of iOS 7 with some additional new features that make the experience a lot better. And the first of which I want to discuss is called interactive notifications. Basically, this allowed you to pull down on a banner notification that comes in and have the ability to reply straight from wherever you want whether you be in an application or on the home screen without having to go to the messages application or whichever application the notification came from for that matter. At the time, this was a hugely requested feature. And it's also worth noting that iOS 8 was the first operating system to run on the larger iPhone 6 and 6 Plus at the time, which were the newest iPhones when iOS 8 was released. So of course, on those devices, you were able to fit more icons on each home screen page and the operating system, of course, adapted for those new displays. And another big feature of iOS 8 was the fact that it enabled you to to download third-party widgets for the notification center directly from the app store and use them in here. So whether it be a news widget or ESPN or wherever it may be, you download it, then you could add it to the menu in here and you know, get updates for whatever the widget is directly from the notification center. iOS 8 was also the first iOS that allowed you to download third-party keyboards from the app store as well. So the same thing you could download, you know, whether it be a swipe keyboard, a keyboard that looked different, 
uh, and you could enable it inside the settings for the first time and actually use it system-wide as your keyboard. iOS 8 also brought the health application to the iPhone for the first time. So this is basically just a hub for all of your health information. Uh, this can communicate with other applications, you know, to send health data to here. And this played a vital role in the launch of the Apple Watch, which did come out during the iOS 8 release cycle to, of course, communicate all the steps and, you know, fitness tracking data straight to this app so you could view it on your iPhone. And it's also worth noting that when the Apple Watch was released, Apple did add the Apple Watch application in iOS 8.3. It was at the time, so you could sync your Apple Watch and everything uh, through this hub. Also, continuity and handoff were big pushes in iOS 8. Basically, the communication between your different Apple devices getting better. So, for instance, you start a task on your iPhone, you're, you're easily able to pick up right where you left off if you want to switch to your Mac and vice versa. iOS 8 also brought AirDrop between iOS and macOS. Once again, just making the connection between your Apple devices a little bit better. Also, SMS sync was a big feature. So, basically, the ability to have your SMS messages that aren't iMessages sync to devices like your Mac and your iPad. Again, even though the SMS messages are only really going through your phone, they will sync across other Apple devices just to have that synchronicity of your messages. This is yet another feature that I use day to day on my Mac. iOS 8 also brought these word suggestions to the stock keyboard just by default. So how you could tap here to get suggestions, uh, that was new with iOS 8. And one of these stranger features in iOS 8 that a lot of people didn't like was the fact that in the app switcher, your recent contacts would appear here. So basically the ability to quickly call or message people that you frequently contact, you could just access it straight from the app switcher. Uh, it was pretty random. I think that's why a lot of people didn't like it. So Apple actually removed it with iOS 9, which I'll get into in a little bit. So very short-lived random feature. Also, iOS 8 was the first iOS version that the podcast application comes pre-installed on. Also, the Books app is pre-installed with iOS 8 as well. And the Control Center has been redesigned as well. So just kind of the way that different sections are separated from one another is different. And when toggles are enabled, they have a different, you know, this white glow effect. Spotlight Search also got a lot better in iOS 8, a lot smarter. It was actually able to bring up a lot more information from the web and whatnot. And I also just want to quickly mention that Apple Music did first launch on an iOS 8 firmware. It wasn't on the original iOS 8. It was actually on 8.4, so pretty late in the release cycle. But even though it was towards the end of the software release cycle, again, iOS 8 was the first operating system to bring Apple Music to iOS. And next up, of course, iOS 9. So probably one of the most noticeable upgrades straight off the bat is the new app switcher. So this was the first time iOS introduced this card style app switcher like this rather than the one where the applications were just side by side. This is of course kind of the design that's still present in iOS today. It's a lot easier to close applications uh, with this design. iOS 9 also introduced the Apple stock news application, which is something that a lot of people use day to day. Also improved Siri suggestions and also just the improved functionality of Siri overall were both big pushes in iOS. 9 just to have more accurate results and just to kind of help you throughout your day whether it be suggesting things to you throughout your day or just the overall functionality of Siri as you can see this new spotlight view with some suggestions was added iOS 9 also introduced low power mode so the ability to toggle on a certain mode and have your iPhone disable certain things to try to save a little bit more battery life also iOS 9 introduced a new San Francisco font throughout the operating system uh, it's a little bit subtle but if you look for it you could definitely see the difference and some other noteworthy upgrades was the introduction of the case sensitive keyboard. So when you turn off uppercase or lowercase, as you can see, the keys actually adapted dynamically. And also the introduction of breadcrumbs, which allow you to go back to the previous application if you were just redirected from one app to another app, just with the simple shortcut like that. Next up, of course, iOS 10. So probably the most noticeable change straight out of the box is the removal of slide to unlock. Now you just press home to unlock or open just like that, depending on whether you have a passcode or not. And at the time when this change was first introduced, when iOS 10 was released, uh, all the iPhones, the modern iPhones rather, did have the Touch ID sensor. So most people weren't even using Slide to Unlock for several years uh, who had the Touch ID sensor. So it honestly wasn't too big of a deal, but for older iPhones and for anybody that isn't using Touch ID, you now press home to unlock. Also, the whole lock screen did get a rework in iOS 10. As you can see, there's actually now little page dot indicators at the bottom. So if you swipe over like this, you would have access to your widgets straight here on the lock screen in this 
brand new design. And if you slide over to the other side, it takes you straight to your camera application. And once you unlock the device, if you go into the notification center, as you can see, that's been reworked, redesigned, and you're also able to access those widgets with a slide over like this, that same list from this area as well. iOS 10 also introduced a brand new control center design. As you can see here, completely different than the previous iOS versions. There's actually now multiple pages. So as you can see, we have a separate music page then all the other toggles. And if you have home devices, home kit set up, there'd be another page for that as well. Uh, as you can see, the toggles actually all have different colors when they're enabled. So that was definitely an interesting touch. And another big change people were very excited about when iOS 10 launched was the ability to remove a variety of stock applications from the home screen for the first time. So of course, all earlier versions of iOS, you couldn't get rid of any of these stock applications from the home screen. But as you can see, you're now able to do that with a variety of applications on iOS 10 for the first time. And of course, you could re-enable them through the App Store. Also, new animations for opening, closing applications and locking and unlocking the device. Uh, it's definitely on the subtler side, but definitely just a little bit springier overall. Uh, once again here, definitely a new appearance. iOS 10 also brought the home application to iOS. So this is a hub to manage HomeKit devices. Uh, just all through one application built straight into iOS. And there was a ton of upgrades to the messages application in iOS 10. Expressive messages were added, so you could add an effect when you send a message. There's also these full screen effects when you send a message so the other person sees it as well. And also things like digital touch, the ability to you know send a little scribble to somebody. Also handwritten message. And also the functionality to type a word out just with normal text and then have it automatically be converted to an emoji if you want. In addition, addition to the new portion of the App Store for iMessage apps. And this is something that's popular so people can download at different games and actually play them with other people over iMessage. And you're also able to download sticker packs from the App Store as well. So just a ton of kind of silly features for the Messages application that don't really need to be there, but just kind of make the experience a little bit more entertaining, I guess. Notifications in iOS 10 also were improved, the addition of rich notifications, and also just across the entire operating system, 3D Touch was just improved the functionality of it, which at the time was on the latest two iPhones, which was the iPhone 7 and the iPhone at 6S. So you're just able to kind of use that feature where you press a little bit harder on the screen in multiple areas throughout the operating system to get new functionality. Next up, of course, iOS 11. So probably the most noticeable thing straight off the bat in iOS 11 is the redesigned control center. So as you can see, yet again, an entirely new interface. The volume and brightness sliders now work uh, up and down rather than horizontally. You're also able to tap and hold on these different modules to expand them to get more information. And most exciting of all, iOS 11 finally enabled the ability to customize the control center. Not the entire thing, just the bottom portion of the control center. But if you go into the settings for a control center, you now have the ability to rearrange and remove certain things in addition to just a whole host of additional toggles being added that you could, you know, add in there if you want. It's also worth noting iOS 11 was the first iOS version to support the iPhone 10, which is the first gesture based iPhone without a home button. So of course, the layout of course was modified to fit the new device's form factor with all the new gestures and whatnot. iOS 11 also changes up the way that the lock screen and the notification center are. So basically the functionality of the lock screen and the notification center are merged in iOS 11. This is what we still have in iOS today. So when you go to your lock screen, you know, of course you have the ability to swipe over to get to the widgets and to get to the camera if you swipe over the other side. And again, for the first time in iOS 11, when you actually unlock your device and swipe down for the notification center, it's the same interface. In previous versions of iOS, it was a separate, slightly different graphical interface for the notification center, but things are just simplified here. It does make more sense this way. Of course, you still get all those notifications just displayed in the same way that they do on the lock screen with, again, the ability to swipe to get to your widgets and the camera if you want. iOS 11 also brought a brand new Siri redesign with some new voices and also just kind of an overall refresh to, once again, the visual appearance. There's a new screenshot in interface that was added that actually showed the screenshot and it appears in the bottom corner. You can even tap on it if you want to edit it. iOS 11 also brought the files application to iOS for the first time. So the ability to, you know, have a file manager on iOS to communicate with other applications to access different files and even just download files straight onto your device if you want to. iOS 11 also brought a redesigned app store. Also, a variety of the stock app icons were updated in iOS 11, the most noticeable of which being the app store and iTunes. Also on the home screen, the labels of applications in the dock were removed and just kind of the overall design of each application with the big text kind of at the top of the name of the app was kind of made standard.
standard throughout a variety of iOS 11 apps. So iOS 11, definitely a pretty big update. Next up, iOS 12. Without a doubt, the headlining feature was the notifications being grouped on a app by app basis, which at the time was something that iOS users really wanted. So it just went for a much more organized notification center. iOS 12 also brought group FaceTime for the first time to iOS. It wasn't in the initial version of iOS 12, it was in 12.1, but pretty big feature. iOS 12 also brought screen time for the first time to iOS. So the ability to, you know, track how you're using your device, how long per day, how long you're doing different things, and even set restrictions for yourself if you want to. iOS 12 also brought the measure application to the iPhone, an application that allows you to measure the length of different things just using the camera and some AR technology. This is an older iPhone 6, so it's not on this iPhone, but on the newer iPhones, iOS 12 did bring that. Siri shortcuts was also a very big feature in iOS 12, the ability to set up these automations and have them do different things. Next up, iOS 13, and without a doubt, the headlining feature was the dark mode with the ability to enable or disable it through either the control center or the settings application again you just have the ability to have all your applications turn into a dark theme which is so much easier on the eyes at night and on OLED display iPhones it's actually a true black so definitely really good feature the volume HUD that normally interrupted your entire screen and popped up in the middle was finally moved to a more minimal location on the side of the screen which was great also the native iOS keyboard received swipe support. So you're able to just swipe on it like that, like most Android phones have been able to do. iOS 13 also features a revamped photos application with improved organization and whatnot. iOS 13 also brought AirPods audio sharing. So basically the ability with two people who have AirPods to listen to the same thing from the same device. And with the death of 3D Touch, iOS 13 also brought all of the 3D Touch actions, now called haptic touch actions, to all iPhones, iPads, and iPod touches just with a tap and hold on any app icon, regardless of, again, whichever device you have. And next up, iOS 14. So as you can see here, without a doubt, the headlining feature of iOS 14 was the ability to add widgets directly to your home screen. So this includes first party ones from Apple, and also you could download third party ones from the App Store. You put your device into edit mode on the home screen, press plus, and again, you have the ability to, again, scroll through here, uh, add widgets of a variety of different sizes, as you can see. And you can even stack them on top of each other if you drag them on top of each other, just like any other app. And then you have the ability to switch between multiple widgets in one little stack. iOS 14 also brought the app library to iOS. So with a swipe over to the left on your last home screen page, basically you have access to this list of all the applications on your device categorized through these different uh, suggestions. And if you slide down or tap on the search bar, you have a, just a full list of all the applications on your device. You could scrub through it alphabetically if you want as well. It's so basically an app drawer for the iPhone. iOS 14 also allows you to hide individual home screen pages. If you go into edit mode again and then tap on these dots at the bottom, you could uncheck and check certain home screen pages to hide them. Um, and then again, as you can see, you only have as many pages as you want. This works well with the app library because any of the apps that were on the hidden pages, you could still access in the app library. And of course, you could re-enable those pages just by re-checking them off in this little menu. iOS 14 also finally brought a compact incoming phone call user interface, so it doesn't interrupt what you're doing on your device. Same thing goes with Siri. Rather than taking up your entire display, it's just kind of a you know, smaller dot at the bottom of the screen. And also responses appear at the top of the screen like this. The messages application got some new features. You can now pin conversations to the top of the messages app. So they stand out from the rest for easy access, just like that. And you're also able to respond to specific messages, whether it be in a group chat or a one-on-one -on -one thread. You're also able to now set third-party applications to be the default browser for your iPhone or the default mail client for your iPhone. And guys, that brings us straight up up to date with the latest iOS version at the time being iOS 15. So without a doubt, iOS 15's headlining feature is the addition of focus modes. So you could set up different focus modes that allow different people to be able to contact you or not be able to contact you depending on the mode that you're currently in. For instance, when you're at work, you could have a work setup that only allows certain people to contact you, maybe your coworkers, 
and maybe certain applications to be able to send you notifications or not send you notifications. There's a whole host of control that you can have over each of these modes. You could even control which home screen pages will show or not show depending on which focus mode you're currently using. FaceTime also received some huge upgrades in iOS 15. SharePlay is now introduced, which basically allows you to watch a video or a TV show at the same time with someone else on FaceTime. Of course, it has limited support right now for a certain subset of apps, but hopefully as time goes on, more applications will be supported. Supported. And that wasn't in the initial version of iOS 15 that was just added in 15.1 recently. You're also able to share the screen of your phone with someone else. So you can show them what you're doing on your device through FaceTime. And you're also now able to create FaceTime links. So this is very similar to Zoom, where you're able to create kind of an event. You could even schedule it for the future and have people join on the web. So this also enables people using Android or Windows or any other operating system to use FaceTime through FaceTime links. Safari received a huge redesign design in iOS 15 as well. As you can see, the address bar has been moved to the bottom of the screen. There's new gestures to switch between open tabs by swiping on the bar. You could swipe over again to make a new tab, swipe up like this to view all of your tabs in this new grid interface. Of course, notifications have been redesigned as well. They're much smaller than iOS 14 and earlier versions of iOS, as you can see in this head-to-head -head comparison. Of course, iOS 15 on the right, iOS 14 on the left. The weather application has been completely redesigned and reworked in iOS 15. And and in the last couple years, I believe Apple acquired Dark Sky, which is a very popular weather application that used to exist. However, of course, now that they own that company, they're starting to incorporate some of the elements from that straight into the weather application in iOS 15. Also, you know, nice new animations and whatnot. Of course, in addition to all the new information, iOS 15 also introduced notification summary, which basically helps you organize your notifications in priority of most important to less important. Also, live text was another feature that Apple made a really big deal about in iOS 15. So basically the ability to copy text from any image just as if it were a body of text, just like that. So then we could paste it, as you can see here. And it works just like that. I think that's pretty impressive. And all right, guys, there you have it. Every single iOS version from the original iPhone OS 1 to iOS 15. Things have certainly come a long way. And if I had to pick a favorite iOS version, it would have to be iOS 7. As I said earlier, it was, in my opinion, the biggest update that iOS has ever seen. And I'll never forget when it was first announced, just how excited I was to get my hands on it. And I'll never forget installing it on this very iPhone 4, as a matter of fact. And again, just being so excited to mess around with all the new features and the redesign. So if you guys have a favorite iOS version, let me know down below in the comment section what it is. And also let me know the oldest iOS version that you used. So what was your first iOS firmware? Mine was iPhone OS 3 on the iPod Touch second generation. But all right, everybody, that just about wraps it up for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I gotta tell you, Apple does not make it easy to go out and install all these firmwares, but it was 100% worth it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching this video and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace out.